Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth annual Undergraduate Ethics Symposium here at the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics in DePaul University. It's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. I'm Bob Steele, the director of the, the Prindle Institute, and with my colleagues, I welcome you to this very special event. And first, what I would like to do is ask our 25 undergraduate scholars from across the country to, uh, to stand and to uh, give them a round of applause for the good work they have presented to be here as part of this uh, symposium. For our 25 scholars, please rise. Thank you very much. Five of the scholars are from DePaul University and the other 20 are from 16 other universities uh, across the country. And I can tell you from having uh, read their, uh, their papers and their creative work that they have brought some excellent uh, rigor to the exploration of ethics issues in a number of very special ways. Tomorrow they have the opportunity to uh, discuss their papers in a forum uh, during the day tomorrow. And we also have the opportunity for th uh, those undergraduate scholars and all of us to hear three scholars from around the country talk about ethics in very important ways. Our keynote address this year is uh, presented by Dr. Robert Bottoms, who was president of DePaul University for 22 years and the founding director of the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics. It's a pleasure to have Bob back with us here at DePaul University. And to introduce Bob this evening is Professor Martha Rainbolt, senior professor of English and the director and coordinator of programs here at the Prindle Institute. Martha? Hi, it's great to see you all here. I'm delighted to see you. Um, and I, when I was thinking about this introduction, I realized, as I said to Nancy at dinner, that there are two audiences here for this talk from Dr. Bottoms. Um, some of you are friends of Bob's from way back. People who have heard him give many, many speeches over the years. Uh, but some of you are participants in our Undergraduate Ethics Symposium and are new to DePauw. So you haven't heard Bob and you don't know quite what to, to expect. I was thinking about this and I was thinking it's a little like the dilemma you have. You know, we're all readers, right? People in this room just by definition are readers. And you know when, you ha when you're ready for a new book, you don't know whether you want to read the new one that's just out or whether you want to read Pride and Prejudice again. You know, I mean, there's that book that you always want to read a second time, uh, a third time, a fourth time. So I, I guess I'm going to, uh, I see this then as a, I'm giving you a short book review for those of you who don't know Bob Bottoms, not that I'm implying that we could ever read him like a book. Um, so after studying and working at Birmingham South and at Emory and at Vanderbilt, Bob came to DePauw uh, in 1978 as the Vice President for University Relations and assumed the President's role in 1986, w which he really lived and breathed for 22 years. He was a tremendously in intense and involved President of DePaul. And in his inaugural address in 1986, he focused on three priorities and those remained at the top of his list throughout his time here. They were diversity, science education, and moral reflection. Let me just say something about the diversity initiative, because DePauw is a different place now from the place that it was when I arrived in 1979 before he was president. It was a good place when I came, um, but the tone and the mood of the university was more like 1950 than 1970. Students referred to the DePauw bubble now, but that was really a bubble. Uh, we were a homogeneous community. We focused on a very enlightened, but a very insular sense of community, I think. The Midwestern values were here, self-discipline, integrity, service to others. But, uh, and I think they've always been a part of DePauw, but there was a limited perception of the world. Um, and, and Bob decided he was gonna change all that, and he did. He used carrots, he used sticks, he poked, he prodded, but he didn't give up. He found the money to make it happen, and he pushed the faculty around. He changed the face of DePaul literally and metaphorically in a hundred different ways. 
in the curriculum, in the faculty, in the staff, in the profile, and most importantly, in the student body. Now we have women's studies and Asian studies and conflict studies, and all of us teach differently because our colleagues have a broader perspective, and they're teaching right next to us, and we got to keep up with them. So one of my colleagues, Mark Chandler, who is in this room, when I asked her what she thought about Bob Bottoms, she said, he made this a place where I wanted to stay. And I think for a, some of us that have been around a long time, that's the way it feels. Bob Bottoms made DePa a place where we wanted to stay. But the most important part of his legacy is in terms of the moral reflection part of that priority, those priorities he talked about in 86, when he said that he, he had a vision that DePa's students would be ages, agents of change. They would be thoughtful women and men of integrity and a firm sense of justice. And so that vision led, along with Janet Prindle and a lot of the rest of the people in this room, to the, Prindle, the Janet Prindle, I'll say the whole name, the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics. We've all been kidding about the fact that it's the Prindle. Uh, and I think that the Prindle is the culminating legacy which Bob gives to DePa, a place for inquiry and discourse about critical issues of our time. So let me close by reminding you of the book metaphor I started with. Over the years, many of us on the DePa faculty looked forward to Bob's speeches, especially the ones at the opening faculty institute where he talked about what he read last summer. Sometimes he groused at us, sometimes he grumbled about the world out there, sometimes he was hopeful. But always he made us think about the new ideas, about liberal arts education, about student learning, and about moral reflection. So I'm eager to hear the next chapter in this book of Bob Bottoms Talks, by the way, he should publish these, where complex and scintillating ideas are at the center and moral reflection is the perspective. So whether you're rereading this book or opening for the first time, please welcome Bob Bottoms speaking to us on listening to annoying voices. Dr. Bottoms. Well, thank you very much, Martha. I don't hardly know uh, what to say, except you made me feel very old in talking about some of these things. And some of you are kind enough, including Mark, to say, you know, I wonder what you've been reading. And I always thought of that. There's one line in the book, Alma Mater, that characterized one of my former colleagues, Phil Jordan's speeches, as he quoted a lot of other people, as though he never had very many ideas uh, himself. I'll be quoting a lot of other people uh, tonight. I, I just want to say one thing of personal privilege because aside from the students who are here as guests of the university, I've had some sort of personal relationship with almost everybody in the room, so I won't embarrass myself or you by telling some of those stories. But I, I do want to say how pleased I am that the Hillmans and the Shanans and the Janet Prindle are here. Um, I told Brian when he became president of DePauw, I did have several ideas while I was president. I never had many that didn't cost a lot of money. <laughs> and it's taken people like you to put this together. The last thing I would say before I start, uh, there are several crowds in here, or several different people. And I had the distinct impression when some of my oldest colleagues came in you were coming to see if, in fact, they were the annoying voices that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I do not, finally, ever remember pushing the faculty around. Um, maybe I should have. Um, well, I was asked to talk about, and this is really aimed for the students, I was really asked to talk about how we go about making decisions. Uh, Bob Steele talked to me about that. I thought about it a long time. And so this is the way I would approach it. I'll, I'll tell you several stories tonight. Maybe we can talk about some of them throughout the weekend. In the New York Times on the 24th of last month, there was a front page article on Libya. And it told the story of how in 2009, some of the top aides to Colonel Gaddafi called together 15 executives from global companies doing business in Liberia. 
they were not asked but told that between them they would shell out the $1.5 billion his country had to come up with for their role in the Pan Am 103 Lockerbie, Scotland terrorist attack and other terrorist attacks. Well, so my question, just to sort of frame our discussion or to start it, if you had been one of those executives, what would you have done? Well, immediately, if most of us were there, we would have said, well, I wouldn't have anything to do with him. That's an emotional kind of reaction. And then some of your colleagues might say, well, well, let's see. If we don't pay, we don't get to do business here. Is that fair to our stockholders? And then somebody else says, well, it's not just our stockholders. It's those folks back in, if you read the New York Times article, back in the Midwest who might even lose some of their jobs because the company's profits are based here and not in the Midwest. But what would you do when these voices began to show different sides of the argument? Or recently I was really taken with the courage of those 50 some odd people who were going into the nuclear plant in Japan, risking their lives, literally, and hopefully to save the lives of perhaps thousands or hundreds of thousands of people they had never seen before. If we had had that opportunity, would we have wanted to be one of those 50 or 52? Is there anything we can imagine that we care about so much we would be willing to risk our lives to make life better for people whose faces we had never seen? Well, all I can do tonight, in, and you'll be pleased with this, in a few minutes, is to try to establish some of the conversations that go on in our minds when we're trying to make important decisions. And some of the voices that we hear become annoying voices because they expose us to the kind of tensions that we subject ourselves to when we have important decisions to make. So the, the first try at it, and I heard from, in the conversations with the students earlier, many of you are philosophy majors, you say, well, you know, we figure things out. We use our minds. We reason together and try to make the right decision. Growing up in Alabama, we'd say, well, we try to figure it out. Michael Sandel was here on our campus uh, early in my presidency. I met him again when Brian and I were having lunch at Harvard. His book, Justice, that came out uh, just a couple of years ago, tells the following story. In 2005, there was a petty officer named Luttrell leading three Navy SEALs. They were deep in Afghanistan. They were working on the theory that they had an opportunity to capture one of the right-hand people of Osama bin Laden. They were obviously very careful. And right before they reached the village where they thought this person was, they hoped to capture, they met two farmers and a 14-year-old boy who were tending their goat herd. They had 100 goats, 14-year-old boy, Two farmers, unarmed civilians. So what are they going to do? Two of the soldiers said, we have to kill them, including the little boy. They will tip off the Taliban as to where we are. And Luttrell just couldn't cause himself to do that. So they let them go. And in a matter of hours, they were surrounded by 800 enemy soldiers. The three Navy SEALs were killed. A U.S. helicopter that tried to rescue them was shot down, and 16 innocent Amer other Americans died. Luttrell said that was the worst decision he had made in his professional career. And he did it on the basis of compassion. How do we make decisions? It's really hard sometimes to figure things out. But that's not all there is to it. We use our minds to be sure. 
That's one voice. But you know, isn't it true that after we've reasoned through a problem and decided how we would like to behave, wouldn't we like to feel good about it? Isn't it what Joseph Badaracco called in the course Bob and I used to teach the sleep test ethic. When I, we go to bed at night, we want to feel like we've done the right thing. Well, some of the neuroscientists have gotten to be a lot more sophisticated than just thinking about we want to sleep on it. One of the authors that I've read a great deal about, a book called The Way We Decide, Jonah Lear, who studied with a Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, says the reason we want to feel good about it is that's the way we're made up as people, that we've had it all wrong for generations. Ever since the Greeks, we have believed that humans are rational people, and this is the way we make decisions. But some of the neuroscientists are saying, no, this is wrong. It's not the way it works at all. There's that little black box in our brain that's being opened up by the neuroscientists. We're not designed, say they, to be rational. Think about it. Some of us have spent a lot of time watching basketball games in the past uh, few weeks. And you know, you can, you can see that, that woman or that man in the finals, you know, and they have a chance to make a free throw in a close game, and what do they do? You know, they bounce the ball and bounce the ball and bounce the ball and think about it and think about it. And some would argue the longer they think about it, the less likely it is they'll make the shot. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly parallel to the way our brain works, but Jonathan Haidt at the University of Virginia told the following story, which I think you will remember, to illustrate how our standard view of morality is wrong in terms of the way we make decisions. He said, it's an error to believe that our decisions are a product of our intellect. He told the story of Julie and Mark. Julie and Mark are siblings. They're vacationing in southern France. They have a delicious dinner. They have some wonderful wine. They're very close to one another, and this brother and sister decide they'll culminate the evening by having sex with one another. Hate points out that Julie is on birth control pills, but nonetheless, Mark uses a condom, that they enjoy themselves, they think it, they talk about it, they think it brought them closer together. They decide, though, probably they shouldn't do it again and that they'll keep it a secret. So in his discussion group, Professor Haight said, anything wrong with this? And everybody said, yes, absolutely wrong. What's wrong? And comes the first reason. But when siblings have sex, they could have abnormal children, genetic defects. But said, hey, didn't I remind you that she was on birth control pills and he used a condom? Second thing, it'll damage their relationship. Didn't I tell you they talked about it and decided it brought them closer together? And Haight says that reason after reason was given and they could all be dispensed with. And then finally someone stood up in the group and said, because it's just wrong to have sex with your sister. And he would agree. He calls it moral dumbfounding. That we just know some things are wrong. Even though we can't rationally always defend that. Emotions are strong. And I would never argue that the emotional part of making decisions is a bad thing. We're also hardwired, if you listen to some of the writings of the neuroscientists, we're also hardwired for sympathy. Paul Slovak, who's a psychologist at the University of Oregon, performed some experiments in trying to get people to respond to meeting the needs of world hunger. And he had pamphlets, he studied those, list of statistics, 11 million people in Ethiopia were starving. Had a control group and they were asked how much money they would give. The control group though was then shown the pictures, the faces of some of the people who were starving. Well, you can guess what happened. 
The people were much more generous. When we see someone's face, we're generally wired to be sympathetic. The last story I'll tell from some of my psychology friends, Harry Harlow, who in the 50s did all these very famous experiments with monkeys at the University of Wisconsin. One of the illustrations that shows what I'm trying to say is he had six monkeys. They were trained to pull various chains to get food, and one chain they could pull, and they got a lot of food. So they learned to pull the chain that gave them the greatest satisfaction. And then, in a manipulative way, he arranged things so that, as the experiment proceeded, when they pulled the chain that gave them the greatest gratification, it shocked the sixth monkey. Shriek, pain, and guess what? Four of the monkeys quickly learned to quit pulling that chain that gave them the most satisfaction. The fifth monkey almost starved out of a desire not to hurt another monkey. A monkey they did not want to have suffer. Well, some of our friends argue that the same thing that happens in these experiments happened to us as people. That emotion is a very impart, important part of making decisions. So here we have two voices. We have our rational voice. We all want to be rational, don't we? And then we have our emotions. And sometimes these voices are annoying because they tell us different things. So we say, well, isn't there some other help we can get in making a decision? Well, in the same book, Justice, Sandel points out that we don't have to be by ourselves. We can hold up the dilemmas we face to the community. It's not so much what goes on in Washington anymore, but it's what good politics are about. Holding up ideas for public debate. We don't have to be alone. Moral reflection is not a solitary pursuit, but a public endeavor. And maybe we can't discover justice on our own. We need to hold our ideas up for correction by the community. And that works in politics. It also works... Uh, one of the most winsome speakers we had at DePauw in the past few years was Parker Palmer. He came here several times. He was a Quaker talking about the circle of trust. And as an individual is trying to make an important decision, you have your friends ask you questions. They don't tell you what to do. They just ask questions. Try to get you to crystallize your thoughts carefully and also to introduce a little humility because we all have had the experience that we can be wrong. Well, we use our brains, our emotions come into play, we can ask others to help us. And, and it was at this point I almost called Bob and said, I don't want to do this speech. Because the more I get to thinking about it, the less I know how even I make decisions. We just have these annoying voices coming at us. Isn't there some place in our lives for ideals? Because some of us like to believe we're idealistic. If we want reason to dialogue with emotion, if we want to hold our ideas up to the community, don't we want our ideals to come into play, to inform the kind of reasoning that we do? The woman who runs the Einstein Forum in Berlin, Susan Niemann, Penned a book a couple of years ago that we used in one of the classes I taught here called Moral Clarity. And she calls for a rejuvenation of idealism in the culture in which we are living, where idealism again comes into play. That it gives us a way to make certain judgments, a way to say that some things are right and some things are wrong. Because whether we like them around very much or not, idealists do make judgments. Idealists are not soft. Idealists do not believe the world as it is exhaust all the possibilities. That the world can be better. 
Idealism is not neutral. It's the distinction between what is and how the world ought to be. And isn't there some value in trying to think more about the way the world ought to be? Let this inform some of our reasoning, our reasoning that makes us human. We can think about the future, and you'll be doing some of that this weekend. Think about the future and imagine it being different, better than, imagining how things could be, even though we've all experienced Disappointment when our ideals don't work out. Another person who influenced the way I think we had a guest, we had as a guest here was Bell Hooks. She said to me one day when we were walking across campus, she said, you know, we don't talk about love very much anymore. And I thought about that. And so if we want to talk about an ideal, I mean, there are many I could have chosen, but I, I think as I began to talk about some of these different voices, I'd like to say a word or two about compassion. One of my favorite writers is Karen Armstrong. She talks a lot about love. She talks a lot about compassion. And she does so from a religious context. I almost hesitate to bring religion up. Because I can say with a smile on my face, God is having a really hard time these days. I mean, we have very aggressive atheists. We have people who associate God with the religion we sort of put together. And we've experienced flagrant problems of religion in the past years. We've had the scandals of child molestation. We've had debates about some of the silliest things in the world whether we should ordain gays to the priesthood. We've had vast displays. I don't know how to characterize this as anything, but ignorance on behalf of many Christians as they talked about the reaction to 9-11 and what our relationship should be with our Muslims, friends. That's religion at its worst. But religion at its best focuses on compassion and on love, and perhaps has some informative influence on the way we make decisions to enter generously into another person's point of view. And in Karen Armstrong's book on compassion, she goes all the way back to the golden rule that some of us learned growing up. Well, it, it wasn't Jesus' idea, really. It goes back to 500 B.C., according to Karen Armstrong, in the life of Confucius, when his disciples ask him, what should we practice every day? And said he to them, never do to others what you would not like them to do to you. And that became the way. Religious traditions argue that compassion is natural. It's as natural as sympathy, that compassion can be the fulfillment of human nature, that we as human beings have the ability to set our ego aside, that we can transcend that naturally selfish self. Now, some people argue that we're just naturally selfish, that anything we do, we always do, even if it's a good thing, we do for a payoff. Garrett Armstrong said there's no doubt that in the deepest recesses of our minds we're all selfish. But she has her own t take on evolution, and it is that much of this egotism is rooted in what some scientists and she call the old brain bequeathed to us over 500 million years ago from the reptiles, but that over the millennia we have developed, we have made some progress and that the neuroscientists with whom she's in conversation talk about a, a new brain, a neocortex, a home of reasonable power, the ability to stand back from those primitive instincts. And so she calls something you've probably thought about. How do we make decisions? She calls for a certain kind of mindfulness 
What in the world does that mean? When we have important decisions to make that we step back, we become aware of those old brain instincts, those selfish things. We can transcend those. She even argues, and, and you must get her book. She has these 12 steps to compassionate living. And it's, it's really pretty good. She argues, we can learn not to be selfish. We can teach the brain how to react in different ways. We don't have to be selfish. We have the ability with repetitive action and disciplined action to construct new habits of thought and feeling. And so if we want to be serious about compassion, and this is the last I'll say about it, it, it perhaps the golden rule is captured as well in the following Buddhist poem as anything I would share. Just a few lines. How do we make decisions? How do we want to live? Let nobody lie to anybody or despise any single being anywhere. Make nobody wish harm to any single creature out of anger or hatred. Let us cherish all creatures as a mother, her only child. May our loving thoughts fill the whole world above, below, across, without limit. Our love will know no obstacles, a boundless goodwill toward the whole world, unrestricted and free of hatred. And whether we are standing or walking, sitting or lying down, as long as we are awake, we should cultivate this love in our heart. This is the noblest way of living. But I'd like to close by discussing just briefly one other character that I got to know very well on this campus. If we want to use our brains, we want to reason in a good way, informed at times by emotion, possibly corrected by the community, enhancing and embracing ideals like compassion. Uh, is there any other help? The last help I would mention is somebody who's really had a tremendous influence on me. Um, some of the conversations I've enjoyed with Cornell West. When I read Cornell West, I just really come alive in terms of helping to inform the passion that I want to generate in my own life to do the right thing. Now, nobody can say Cornell West is not an intellectual, that he doesn't use his intellect, he doesn't use his ability to reason. Nobody can say, even though he is a very emotional person that he bases everything he says on emotion, or that he denies correction by the community, or that he doesn't stand up for his ideals, or that he's not a compassionate person. Because in closing, what I want to say, and it almost, this goes back to the phone call I never made to Bob saying, I'm not going to give this speech, because what I really wanted to talk about was compassion and ideals. And my fear was, because there's enough difference in the experiences I've had and the experiences some of you have had as a student, that compassion just sounds so safe. Such a nice idea. But if you understand Cornell West and some of the things he has understood and some of the speeches he gave on this campus, it takes a lot of courage, said he on the stage of Meharry Hall, it takes a lot of courage to interrogate yourself. It takes courage on the social level. One of the things you'll be talking about this weekend and with the speakers that are, will be talking, how is it that we became so adjusted to injustice? We talk a little this weekend about hate groups, about the aftermath of Katrina, about racism. West reminds us, how is it we become so adjusted to this stuff? It takes courage to try to answer that question takes courage to interrogate oneself. So we have our education, we have the dialogue with all these voices, we reflect, we are shaken up, and we begin to feel that one idea is not as good as another, that there aren't any simple answers, and that above all else, there's not any certainty. We're torn by so many voices, and we can't just get rid of some of these annoying corrections. The golden rule. And this 
was beginning to be the last thing I would want to say. In short, would it even be possible as young people, as older people, if we could go through our life considering the welfare of everybody else to be just as important as our own welfare? I mean, that's sort of what the golden rule is about. And that is so radical because if we're not going to do anything to anybody else we wouldn't want them to do to us, as Confucius said, then that sort of implies we're all equal. And if we're all equal, then not one of us is privileged over another. Now, some would argue this sounds like an assault on natural selection because natural selection kind of wants us to behave like our individual happiness is special. But love or compassion just might make us want to go further and further the happiness of others. But let's give up a little of ourselves so others can have a lot. Lower animals don't have that ability, that capacity. So as I close, let me just say, uh, I just hear all these voices. And they argue in my brain when I'm trying to decide what's right and what's not. But isn't it true that we really mustn't be afraid? We live with these tensions. We hope we act out of compassion. We hear these annoying voices, and they're annoying because they're always trying to say, well, it might not be the way you thought, it might be some other way. Don't we want to be rational? Yes. Nobody wants to have said to them in the groups that will take place tomorrow and Saturday, well, what you've written is just totally irrational. Nobody wants to hear that. We all want to be able to live so we can sleep at night. We would all like to be cared enough by a community, be loved by a community, even to be corrected by a community. And most of us would like to say, we would like to think that this principle of compassion somehow lives out in our lives. So finally, the other voice that is really annoying is wouldn't we also like, after this big debate is over, to know that we are certain? That's the most annoying voice of all to me. It could be that these arguments, though, and these voices competing to inform us, these debates, these dynamics, this is really what does make us human. We will never be certain. So how do we decide? We use our brains. We're informed by emotion. We're open to community correction. We hold steadfast to some of our ideals, although they're constantly being questioned and examined. We strive to do what compassion requires, always knowing the one thing we'll never know, and that is that we are certainly correct. Would any of you like to continue the conversation with Bob on this? Are there any questions from anyone? You've certainly given us a lot to think about here. Marco, let me start it out and I don't want to lose your thinking if I could. Okay. First of all, Bob, thank you for not making a call to me and saying you didn't want to make a speech. I'm glad you made it. Early on, you used the phrase, if I captured it correctly, early on you said, moral reflection is not a solitary pursuit. And you played that out in several ways. But would you come back to that specific phrase? I, I'm interested in, in, in both further uh, articulation of that, and also what the roots are of that for you. What, what are the underpinnings of why you believe that? 
Well, this is one of the reasons I like uh, Michael Sandel so much. That's one of the premises of his book, Justice, and that is that, that the decisions we have to make, particularly in politics or in, in working for the common good, even in defining what the common good is, that it takes all the voices in the community. We, can't, we just can't go off by ourselves and figure this out. And I really have an appreciation for that. Um, you ask practically some of the roots. And I, I kind of say with a smile on my face, uh, I can th think of some very painful times when I held some of my ideas or my tentative decisions up for correction by the community. And the community did a wonderful job of telling me I was wrong. And, and that's an important part of the dialogue, that we don't have to do this by ourselves. And I think that's one of the things I've appreciated about Parker Palmer, you, you know, sitting around in a circle. Some of us have had that experience of going to a Quaker retreat. And, and people are not banging you on the head, they're just asking you questions to try to get you to crystallize your ideas. And it's always a challenge. And uh, I do think those are agonizing voices. When somebody says to you, are you sure? Or how do you know? Anything else? Yes. Um, I really appreciate you drawing out the idea of having voices in oh. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you drawing out the idea of having voices in tension as we're trying to make decisions. But I, I think for myself, the more that I think about being involved in the sort of community activist work that really matters for more matters for me, I think that being true to emotion and being true to community and ideals are really dynamically connected. So unless I'm attending to my own emotional well-being, there's no way I can be fully present in a community or be true to my ideals because if you're not if you're not emotionally and physically sound, you can't give yourself fully to others. So I wonder if you could address the idea of some of these things not being intention so much but as being necessarily connected. Well, certainly things, what I was trying to say, certainly things like idealism, and then I tried to say compassion as an example of, of one ideal, uh, maybe are not intention. But let me give you a concrete example of just the tension in my life and the way my brain works. And some of you will take this as frivolous, but just forgive me, it's the way my brain works. In Evanston, Illinois, where I work, um, there's a CVS store. Outside the CVS store, they alternate between, I don't know what kind of arrangement they have with the city of Evanston because it's always the same one or two poor people asking for donations. It's always the same, one, one of two. Well, sort of the way I grew up in trying to be a compassionate person, I really have trouble passing up those fellows. Now, but my brain can start to work. I say, well, you know, why do you give a dollar? Why do you give five dollars? And their brains work too. What, they got to know me pretty well. One fellow said, and I'm not trying to be facetious. One fellow said, you know, you've been really good to me, and you know what the largest gift I've ever had was? He said, somebody gave me $100, and I thought, God, he could be a development officer. <laughs> you know? But that very practical thing, you know, what's my responsibility if I really wanted to live out the compassion care arms I was talking about? And my brain starts to work and say, well, you can't give them everything. You can't, give, why would you give them $10? And, and they really feed into that. And this is why I said, I'm really not trying to be cute, but I swear to God, this is true. One day, I, one week, I missed one fellow. I never saw him all week. And I said, where's your friend? And they said, he's on spring break. <laughs> and I thought, gosh, you know, look at all these voices. I'm not trying to be flip. I'm trying to say that in attempts to be compassionate sometimes, we, we can... Uh, reason will uh, can talk us out of it. So I say tension. Every, everything I see in life, I, I, um, Bob knows this from the teaching we did I, it, it, in seeing things. I sort of develop everything I see. There's a tension to it. 
know, can ideals sometimes win out? Compassion sometimes win out? I, you know, I hope so. discussion about emotion and the relevance of emotion from moral decision making very you know, suggestive and interesting. And I know you're not going to be able to provide me with what I want. Which is something I, I know that too. Of the, <laughs> when you should trust emotion and when you should be distrustful of it. Because I find myself thinking about cases like Huck Finn, who reason tells Huck Finn that the slave gym is property and ought to be returned to its owner, but emotion tells him, I just can't do it. And emotion is right there, and reason is wrong. But then in cases like the incest case that we talk about, it seems like a paradigmatic case where emotion is wrong. We just have this, you know, these gut reactions from cultural taboos, that things like, oh, it's just wrong to breastfeed in public. Oh, it's just wrong. It's, it's just wrong to have any kind of sexual behavior that creates a certain norms and you know so I, I'm at sea thinking when when can I go with that that feeling and when should I when should I resist it? So just answer it quickly for me so I'll know. Yeah. <laughs> well I really appreciate the spirit in which you asked the question because I don't have any idea. Uh, I'm fascinated by some of the studies that the neuroscientist people are doing and some of the psychologists and in terms of trying to figure out the role that emotion plays. And I can't say anything quite it's helpful at all other than this tension, the same one that, that you're talking about. You know, sometimes it seems right. We do, as Badaraka says, we do want to sleep at night. I mean, we do have that sort of built in. Some of the folks say we have sympathy built in. Sometimes there's a lot of evidence you can trust that. But who among us would say we would like to just fly by our guts all the time? Anything else? And we can talk about some of this tomorrow. Hi. Thank you for a very intriguing talk. One of the fascinating things I learned about you this afternoon is that you grew up in Birmingham, Alabama during the Civil Rights Movement. And that you actually left the Methodist Church um, and, um, be, and joined the Episcopalian Church because of what you saw as the Methodist sort of unwillingness to embrace civil rights. And my question comes to the role of ethics in the community and when do we as communities stand up and say that something is wrong. When I first heard the title of your talk, um, listening to Annoying Voices, the first thing I thought of was Cherry Jones. <coughs> and that's her Florida. Oh, <laughs> oh burn the... Wants to burn the crane and now wants to put the Prophet Muhammad on trial. Yeah. I was in, Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan when um, he did burn the Quran. And while I understand that people here are trying to ignore him, um, it has real life consequences over there. Um, and I'm wondering why I haven't heard more. And I guess it's not really a question to you about not to put the whole community of faith on trial, but when, how do you apply the, the philosophies that you spoke about to communities? When do communities stand up and say, we don't care, you know, this person is exercising his right of free speech, but we don't all agree? Mm -hmm. How do you bring these tenets of brains in motion, community growth? When does the community correction begin to be the yeah, thing that gets heard? It's going to be the thing that's heard. Hey. We had that private conversation down there, and maybe I could clarify a couple of things. And then uh, I also am not a good person to uh, defend the church. Uh, most of the experiences I had in the church were not positive. Which is kind of an odd thing for somebody who's president of a seminary to say. Um, maybe it's just an attempt to correct some of those things. Um, my experience, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I can say, I'm young enough that uh, most of the civil rights movement, the, the things that John, most of it was gone, settled before I came along. 
But I found myself as, as uh, the uh, assistant pastor of the largest Methodist church in the state. And uh, people thought I was a good speech maker. And the issue in our church was whether or not we would have a daycare center. I couldn't care less whether we had a daycare center. I didn't know why we needed a daycare center until some of the people started saying the reason we don't need a daycare center is we'll have to integrate it. So then I became for the daycare center. And what I said to you when we were down, the, the thing that was disillusioning to me about the church was the same people who were telling me that I was a good preacher voted the wrong way every time. I said, well, there's just a real disconnect here. And so I was disillusioned and, and I left. Um, my experience in some of the traveling Gwen and I have done in Europe, uh, and you see some of the, uh, well, when we went to Avignon and we saw the palaces and where the Pope uh, uh, lived, and I, you, you know, I was kind of, I was thinking about why wasn't some of that money used to feed poor folks? And so I'm not a defender of the church so much as I am a believer in the kind of compassion I was trying to talk about. And that at times the church can model that. And at times, at times even in whether it be hate crimes or whatever, you know, this, this fellow who burned the, the Koran. Um, I mean, the community should just rise up. And, and I think maybe it has begun to in that case. And just say, we're not going to tolerate this stuff anymore. Uh, that to me is kind of the essence of compassion we were talking about and reasoning and correcting. I, I don't want to be, maybe I should close with this, I don't want to leave with you thinking that any time we, that I was advocating any time we hold something up to the community that a positive correction will take place. I know of instances where we held things up in the community and exactly the wrong thing was made because the community might have been racist to its core. So, I just go back. The only way I know in terms of personal decisions is wrestling with all these different voices. And I think holding things up for correction to the community um, is one potential opportunity. So there's refreshments and fun and jazz at the duck tonight for the students. I hope you'll all uh, go back to the Inn at DePauw and have a good uh, visit and continue the conversation that Bob has started. And then we will, uh, in the morning, we will reconvene and continue these ideas with, with Bob and the speakers. Uh, thank you again for coming and see you tomorrow morning.